So once again, welcome everyone to the FTGS Global Voices Seminar Series. This series of events uh, with incredible uh, early career scholars is designed to showcase and amplify the expertise and research of members of the Feminist Theory and Gender Studies section of the ISA. Uh, it's also in partnership with King's College London. Uh, our events are recorded and are going to be available on YouTube. You can also see our past events. Uh, so make sure to follow our social media. I'll send the links later on so you can get uh, you can get the links and, and you can follow what we're doing there, too. The series is has been organized and is hosted by Dr. Amanda Shizom, a senior lecturer in security studies uh, and researcher in gender security at King's College London, who could not be here with us today, unfortunately. Uh, however, I'm also the series, the series co-host. Uh, I'm Lua Tomas. I'm a PhD student currently researching feminist movements in South America in a historical perspective. Uh, the Global Voices seminar aim to promote global conversation on issues pertaining to feminism, gender, and international relations. And for today, we are pleased to welcome as our speaker, speaker Dr. Maria Taniak, who is currently a fellow and senior lecturer at the Department of International Relations at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. Her discussion today, which is titled, Who Cares for the Carers? Uh, will address feminist ex explanations for the depletion of care in times of crisis by drawing on pandemic experiences in the Philippine, Philippines. Uh, to discuss Dr. Tanyak's research, we are honored to have Dr. Dr. Elizabeth Pruvo, Professor of International Relations and Director of the Gender Center at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Thank you so much, both of you, for being with us today. And uh, once again, people can ask questions in the chat. And I'll leave the floor uh, to you, Tanya. I'm going to, to share here the screen. Great. Thank you so much, Lua. Um, while we're setting up, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, you and Professor Prugel for um, being here today, but of course also to FTGS and King's College, largely through the work of Amanda, Dr. Amanda Chisholm, in putting the seminar series together. Um, it's, uh, it's absolutely a huge honor to be part of this seminar series because I know from the previous seminars that it's been really uh, an amazing um, showcase of research and, and community that we are building. Um, so my paper is in its very early stages and I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging how difficult the past two years have, have, has been. And um, speaking in a relative privileged position of being based in Australia, but of course, Filipino and watching the pandemic unfold with all my relatives and families and friends in the Philippines. Um, it was very hard. It was very hard to, to think uh, and write um, uh, as um, bodies were piling up. Um, and so this, this paper is an attempt, um, now that we are in relative um, position of reflecting and trying to really make sense of what has happened then and what is still ongoing, um, uh, uh, I hope to actually use this um, seminar as an opportunity to really um, challenge and develop this work further. Um, in line with that, I'd like to also acknowledge that this research has received funding from the Japan International Cooperation Agency, and I'm very grateful um, that I've been invited to be part of their Human Security and Practices of Empowerment in East Asia, through which um, I was able to also um, gain the support of my research assistants. So I'd like to thank Ezekiel Benedicto and Marielle Kyoge for their um, support. Um, because again, if not for them, this project um, would not have been possible. So what is this paper about? I think I started it because at the height of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, health workers and women's rights service providers worldwide clearly experienced severe depletion and mortality. Globally, health and, health and social care workers, 70% of which are women, are dealing with a whole host of adverse impacts from depression, PTSD, chronic stress and fatigue, to disproportionate exposure to the health risks of COVID-19, including death. So one study pointed out that it was estimated that between 80,000 to 180,000 health work 
health and care workers may have died from COVID-19 from January 2020 to May 2021 alone. One study which drew on worldwide data at the start of the pandemic suggests that the cases of healthcare workers infected were of course predominantly female. Within the profession, nurses were the largest group infected, while doctors constituted the majority of deaths. The study also shows where data on ethnicity is available, such as in countries like Australia, France, and the UK, these deaths tended to be for people of color. However, data collection and reporting challenges, especially in developing countries with pre-existing structural barriers to healthcare service delivery, mean that many cases of harms and deaths borne by um, health and social workers are invisible and unaccounted for. According to the World Health Organization, the number of COVID-19 deaths and infection cases among healthcare workers is expected to be greater than officially reported. So workers in these sectors, which constitute the paid care economy, were also universally recognized as essential to, the backbone of, or in the front line of pandemic response. However, being essential and on the front lines of the pandemic meant that they were also faced with intensified risks to personal safety and direct threats to life. Paid carers have been crises shock absorbers, such that in many cases, they were on the direct receiving end of blame for failures in pandemic response. For instance, there have been reports of healthcare workers, particularly those in low income and middle income countries for which Philippines is part of, have, uh, that these workers have been subjected to discrimination, abuse, and even vilified by their own governments and local communities. The mental and emotional stra strains they continue to bear in their workplaces are further compounded by violence and exclusions within their own homes, communities, and the state. These costs weigh heavily on the psychosocial and mental well-being of service providers and compounds the pressures on health systems to cope. Indeed, such an environment created conditions for these workers to be unwilling and unable to report to work, thereby further deepening gaps in the pandemic response. And so for me, seeing all of these unfold, and again, how it was strongly experienced in the Philippine case, where I'm originally from, one of the most striking paradoxes of the pandemic was that why at a time when our collective need for care is most profound and most intense, that the very sources and providers of care were not egregiously neglected and violated, but it was also assumed as unlimited, self-renewing and bottomless. So while clearly a global phenomenon, as I've mentioned, this paradox is even more perplexing in the case of the Philippines a country whose competitive edge in the global labor market is built on nationalist quality of care. Tracing global care circuits, for instance, reveal that the costs of the pandemic for Filipino paid care workers are both gendered and racialized. For example, there have been reports that the death toll among healthcare workers in California and in New York, global cities severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, were heavily impacted, uh, heavily impacted Filipino Americans who represented 20% of the nursing workforce. This is corroborated by a Time Magazine feature article citing research on the disproportionate impacts of the pandemic on nurses. According to data gathered by the National Nurses United, Filipinos constituted 4% of registered nurses in the US, yet they accounted for 26.4% of the total number of nurses who died from COVID-19 and related complications. This death toll amounted to almost half of the nurses, who died, nurses of color who died in the US. Meanwhile, back in the Philippines, Filipino health workers have called out the mismanagement of the pandemic and have demanded long overdue compensation and financial support from the government. There have been nationwide problems in the availability of personal protective equipment ventilators, beds, and diagnostic equipment and supplies. Um, next slide, please. This is an image of, at the height of the pandemic, how, because of extreme shortages in the supply of PPEs, health workers, especially community health workers, have had to improvise. And as graphic as this might look like, it was definitely something widely reported in my own um, 
uh, data collection. So here, for those who um, are not able to see, um, uh, health workers improvise using garbage bags and, and layering garbage bags. And imagine again that they were um, using this for extended periods of time and, and the compounded health risk on that um, is clearly and visibly um, evident. So many of the Filipino health workers who have you know, even had to improvise their PPEs and use personal resources to procure supplies were also very much reliant on private donations and um, a lot of these community-led initiatives. However, at the same time, health workers face stigma from their own communities. And reportedly, immediately in the, in the months of the pandemic, many were told to vacate their homes, many were denied public transport or refused services by local businesses. By September 2021, the country's own Department of Health reported that there have been at least 104 health workers who died from COVID-19. It was unsurprising, therefore, that many Filipino health workers protested the government's ban, preventing them from seeking jobs overseas while they continue to receive inadequate support as part of the national response. While the overseas employment ban was eventually lifted, the government has put a limit allowing only 5,000 healthcare workers per year can go abroad significantly less compared to the typical annual rate of 13,000 workers per annum. The profound hardship they face is such that Filipino carers, paid carers, were risking working for pandemic responses abroad, where they will also face heightened mortality in exchange for perceived better conditions uh, compared to working in Philippine health systems, where they and their families have also had to deal with either dying from COVID-19 or from hunger. So this paper charts feminist explanations for the depletion of care in times of crisis by drawing on the gendered politics of care for carers in the Philippines. I argue that the depletion of carers is not incidental, but rather integral to the crisis-driven reinvention of state and global economy. Consequently, I seek to unsettle prevailing narratives that frame these harms as unavoidable occupational health issues in normal times and as collateral damage during the pandemic. This research presents preliminary evidence from an online survey and key informant interviews with health workers and women's rights service providers from the National Capital Region of the Philippines where Manila is based, is the largest urban area. And this region, the National Capital Region, is also where approximately 41% of the total number of confirmed cases and 39% of deaths um, for the whole country is located. Manila, the capital, has also been reported to have had one of the longest lockdowns in the world. And while the country as a whole has been ranked the worst place during the pandemic. The survey consisted of 89 anonymous respondents in total, with 51 identifying as health workers and 38 as women's rights service providers. Key informant interviews were conducted with 10 representatives from organizations of and for health workers and women's rights service providers. I'm also drawing on secondary sources, including um, the COVID-19 monitoring reports produced in the country to corroborate this data. So in trying to make sense of the depletion in times of crisis, I build on already existing um, and very vibrant feminist scholarship in security studies and political economy, and particularly on the depletion framework, depletion through social reproduction framework. And I can explain that further in the Q&A. Um, but the pandemic impacts on the health and well-being of paid carers. And particularly in this project, I look at health workers and social welfare, particularly women's rights welfare providers, have been predominantly viewed through biomedical and workplace hazard explanations that tend to focus on infectious disease outbreaks as sui generis. Or oh, particularly that these infectious disease outbreaks are unique in a uh, unique form of crisis. By contrast, I argue that feminist perspectives alert us to the ways in which the pandemic is structurally and discursively connected with other forms of global crises from armed conflicts, disasters, and climate or environmental risk, and of course, economic crises. 
For instance, across these forms of crises, we know that feminist scholarship have shown that the lack of women's participation and leadership in decision-making processes has been a constant thread across all forms of crises. Despite women comprising the overwhelming majority of healthcare workers globally, they represented 25% of COVID-19 task forces in 36 conflict and post-conflict countries where data was available. Moreover, the default has been to double down on militarism and unprecedented insecurity posed by the overlapping of COVID-19 to climate change. In the 2021 UN Secretary General's annual report to the Security Council on Women, Peace and Security, it was pointed out that during the pandemic, military spending as a share of gross domestic product, in fact, even reached a global average of 2.4% the largest increase since the global financial crisis. This increase amounted to $2 trillion in 2020, reflecting therefore a significant disparity compared to pandemic-related health spending worldwide. So as I mentioned, I'm very much drawing on trying to learn from the vast feminist scholarship that have looked at um, depletion in the context of conflicts, um, disasters, and increasingly in climate change uh, and economic crises um, to understand that over and over and across different types of crises, we see that women in paid and unpaid care economies bear the brunt of this constant privileging of warfare over welfare, especially in times of of crises, security is re-embedded in state-centric and militarized logics that govern the distributions of resources and authority. Moreover, the societal harms we are witnessing today have their roots in the global crisis in social reproduction, which have been cyclical and underway prior to the pandemic. Nancy Fraser situates the crisis in social reproduction in terms of this inherent contradiction or crisis tendency of capitalism. As she points out, on the one hand, social reproduction is a condition of possibility for sustained capital accumulation. On the other hand, capitalism's orientation to unlimited accumulation tends to destabilize the very processes of social reproduction on which it relies. She adds further that periods of crisis are in fact defined by boundary struggles, which refer to the historical and contextualized modes of struggle over the boundaries delimiting economy from society, production from reproduction, and work from family. Building on this conceptualization of crises, I interpret the depletion of carers during the pandemic within such ongoing and cumulative boundary struggles that feature in the contemporary contradictions of our patriarchal and racialized global economy. Fundamentally, as I argue in this paper, we are witnessing boundary struggles over who is owed care, when, how, and why. And so in my research and drawing on the interviews and key inform, uh, sorry, interviews and online survey, I map out three of these boundary struggles. First is the economic devaluing of social reproduction. Second is the cultural valuing of social reproduction. And finally, the security misvaluing of social reproduction. So I'll briefly explain what this means and, and, and how um, a lot of this is very much informed and engaged with the experiences of carers um, on the ground. I also argue that these three interconnected boundary struggles allow us to understand and really um, point out that crises are multi-sided and expressed in relation to contextualized material and discursive processes. They merge and endure following particular crisis specific or crisis induced logics. Um, and again, I'll explain that a bit further. So first is on the economic devaluing of social reproduction as the first arena through which um, we see these um, uh, depletion um, processes occurring. One of the contestations that research participants of this project raise is the categorization of, of course, essential labor and which workers deserve special entitlements. So as part of the Philippine response, and as in many other countries, emergency laws and policies were enacted to mobilize tremendous resources um, in the service of the pandemic response. My key informant stated that despite the discursive representation of 
healthcare workers as essential, economic distribution of release, relief assistance, proper pay and risk compensation reflected artificial divides between public and private health workers and between those supposedly directly responsible in treating COVID-19 patients and the rest who are not. These differentiations were unhelpful and did not reflect realities of care relations on the ground. For instance, within the Philippine state, one and by and two, these are the emergency measures uh, and law passed by the government. Um, women's rights service providers who have long been filling the gaps of healthcare service delivery in the country were excluded. As one informant explained, private institutions were left out. No hazard pay, no incentive pay, but the risk was there too, even if we weren't treating actual COVID patients. Community healthcare workers, such as those at the barangay or village level, who have long subsidized health systems in the Philippines, especially in remote and rural areas, have been further disadvantaged too. Research studies have shown that even prior to the pandemic, these barangay health workers have been poorly paid and typically kept voluntary, such that even they, uh, such that they end up even subsidizing community health through their own out-of-pocket expenses. And again, very similar to the image you're seeing um, in the slide. Thus, the largely um, women-led barangay health force has been heavily mobilized in local pandemic responses, yet these workers were not entitled to the same benefits as other health workers. Uh, worse, they were often left out in distribution of PPEs and have had to procure their own and therefore help explain why COVID infection cases among healthcare workers were predominantly female. The responses from the survey corroborates how economic devaluing shapes which actors are seen as providing care for carers. In my survey, I asked health workers and women's rights service providers to assess or reflect on the level of satisfaction they have for the support they receive from employers, local government, national government, and from their family, friends, and community. Next slide, please. And the results were perhaps for me, <laughs> very interesting. So in this table, you see um, results of that data where I asked for them to rate the level of trust um, in the ability of the following groups to provide the care and support they needed. Um, among healthcare workers, um, they positively um, rated family, friends, and communities. And as we move from employer to local government to national government, we see a pattern of declining um, confidence or trust in the ability of these um, institutions or actors to provide care and support. Women's rights service providers, similarly, um, 92 was the average score in, from, in terms of zero to 100. 92 was the score, average score that they gave for family, friends, and community. And as we move from the relationships of care from direct to indirect um, uh, or you know um, as the scale of caring relationships um, change um, we see a, a, a decline and in particular you see a strong contrast between the 92 score for family friends and community to 50 for national government and 87 among healthcare workers, family, friends, and community, and 62 to the national government. So very low compared to the very strong um, belief that they, be they get better support from family, friends, and communities. Um, so for me, this is very interesting. And again, allows us to make sense of what is happening in terms of the experiences of carers. In the Philippine context, um, what we are seeing here is really reflective of the, uh, the national government. Uh, so I was writing um, and working on this um, at a time when Duterte, President Duterte, former President Duterte was still um, uh, the president. And the approach that the government has taken was as other studies have shown or emerging studies have shown was very much military led. And in military led in the sense that um, the decision making body in charge of the pandemic was um, led by military personnel, but also that a lot of the framings of the, the response and, and, and the justifications of interventions um, 
emergency interventions deployed um, used um, war-like framing. So again, like other countries that they refer to it as battlefront or the, the virus as the enemy and so on. Distinctly in the Philippines uh, uh, as well, that these um, processes reflected um, economic devaluing was very much in intersection with pervasive corruption. So tremendous resources accessed by the state for the pandemic are now unaccounted for. Approximately $1 billion worth of COVID-19 pandemic funds. These are now, um, uh, there are now ongoing Congress inquiries on cases associated with overpriced deals purportedly for purchasing PPEs. However, at the same time, this has meant that two years since the pandemic, many healthcare workers still have not received proper compensation. With respect to ongoing delays and gross miscalculation of hazard pays and benefits, one of my informants stated, sobrang binarat, barat na barat. Is that the cause of their suffering? And here, for those who speak Spanish, it's very much the influence. Barat means, or barato, means to devalue or cheapen the actual work. Um, and so there was a strong sense of how their work, their suffering were, was very much cheapened by um, the government. So the second um, boundary struggle refers to the cultural valuing of social reproduction. And here I'm looking at precisely how cultural values, beliefs and practices are made to complement this economic devaluing. That is, the absence of material inflows to care for carers is at best mitigated by and at worst normalized through cultural valorization. valorization. Paid carers, especially at the height of the pandemic, were widely heralded as modern day heroes and were valorized for their selflessness and altruism. Such discursive strategies have long been employed by the Philippine state in sustaining its remittance driven economy and export of care workers globally. It allows the state to harness care labor without the corresponding inflows to replenish and renew care. This is also very much gendered because in the country, good femininity is often framed as selflessness, self-sacrificing, suffering in silence and so on. <clears throat> so it was unsurprising that when the pandemic um, when the COVID-19 um, broke out, um, paid carers were made to feel grateful and obliged into bottomless service through similar techniques of cultural or non-material rewards. These include, and, and indeed something more globally, um, uh, all the um, honoring from clapping to the labeling of them as heroes um, and the tributes that they receive from their patients and com communities. I'm not saying that these tributes and, and forms of appreciation are, are bad. And indeed, a lot of my informants um, shared how much it made a big difference um, in the context of the suffering and the economic devaluing that they were experiencing. It actually helped significantly. However, it is also important to question because when healthcare workers or paid carers transgress these cultural expectations, such as in deciding to quit and seek employment overseas, they were disciplined and framed as unpatriotic. As one informant pointed out, when the government issued a deployment ban, they said, we are being told we can't leave because we have to serve first and be nationalist. This is too hurtful when in fact, many have volunteered without salary or are working for small salaries. But this is now about food security for our family. If they can't go out, or if you can't go out of the country, they have no other income. She further described that in effect, this policy made them prison nurses, or imprisoned nurses, prison nurses. Um, and there are other forms of these um, uh, social cultural safety nets that were indirectly relied on. For instance, Bayanihan, or what we, uh, which refers to mutual aid practices among communities were valorized as again, um, pr proving Filipino spirit of community and resilience, but they actually emerge out of desperation and necessity. In the absence of state assistance, what was left for health workers and women's rights service providers is to resort to forms of self-help or what my informant said as sariling sikap, 
and an over-reliance on Filipino cultural values of kusang loob or volunteerism. Several programs and initiatives were indeed developed by um, networks of health workers and women's rights service providers to care for their own. So they even had to um, be the frontline responders to the frontline responders. So for me, these social networks are vital because not everyone was able to benefit from close-knit family and community. Indeed, um, uh, however, the pandemic has reinforced how these safety nets are neither elastic nor always reliable. A number of key informants reported that, especially with the spread of misinformation on COVID-19, there were cases of health, Filipino healthcare workers who were not accepted back by their families and communities. And so organizations even have had to step up by providing them temporary dorms so that they have a place to stay and even provide them with counseling. And so here is the private sector that stepped in to fill in tremendous gaps in care. Next slide, please. I also asked um, uh, care workers, paid care workers, about their trust in their capacity for self-care during the pandemic. And this is the result um, from, of, of that survey. The responses affirmed that paid carers did not expect much care to come from the national government, as, as we've seen in, that, in table one. However, that is in strong contrast to their overwhelming belief in self-care and self-reliance. As shown in figure one, health workers and women's rights service providers expressed trust in their ability to take care of their own health and well-being. Existing studies, of course, have long shown that women in the paid and unpaid care economy are faced with multiple burdens of care, but do not necessarily benefit from or receive care themselves, um, especially from others, because they themselves feel they are not entitled to care. And gendered cultural expectations, of course, play a strong role in this uh, through language of maternal love and sacrifice, which shape the inflows to sustain paid and unpaid care labor. In the Philippines, these responses need to be interpreted in relation to, as I've mentioned, cultural expectations around suffering in silence and so on. Especially for women, they are assumed to bear hardships for love of and submission to family, community, and nation. Expectations on feminized martyrdom can intensify in crisis settings. In effect, the state benefits from paid carers' individualized strategies to absorb the pandemic and self-renew their labor. Therefore, rather than see this as entirely positive, this response that we are seeing here, I argue that what it actually reveals to us is a symbiotic relationship between a government that parasites from a strong sense of self-care among healthcare workers and women's service rights providers in order to survive a crisis. Finally, and this is interested in I'm um, getting feedback on because it actually also caught me off guard. <laughs> According to several key informants, the culture of human rights, which sets a binary between duty bearers and right holders, rights holders, is also contributing to the lack of care for carers. Particularly for social workers and women's NGOs, they are seen as duty bearers in providing relief and assistance even before the pandemic, right? However, within this framing, they never thought of their own entitlements and did not even seek to ask help from the government, especially at the height of the pandemic. One informant stated that as someone working for an NGO delivering services at the community level, they, people, assume that because we chose to do this, we don't need care. But the reality is that there is compassion fatigue. Boundary struggles over human rights-based frameworks reveal, I argue, long-standing critiques of feminist scholars who caution against the dangers of treating individuals as atoms situated outside of or beyond webs of caring relations. Moreover, that a human rights framework subsumed within a neoliberal governance is inadequate in capturing the full cost of care. So with my remaining time, I'll talk about security misvaluing of social reproduction. And this is one that I'm also developing. So for me, the third arena of boundary struggles refer to how social reproduction is misvalued in relation to security. 
the preeminence of militarism as a guiding principle in framing problems, prescribing appropriate courses of action in crisis response, and for prioritizing state security comes at the cost of engaging with other guiding principles that can reorient crisis responses away from hierarchical and competitive modes of thinking on the relationship between state and society and within societies. Militarized crisis responses are surgical interventions that target symptoms rather than root causes. Militarized pandemic response in the COVID-19 pandemic shows how security approach stratifies health issues rather than view them holistically to, de to the detriment of resourcing social reproduction. More importantly, boundary struggles over militarized pandemic responses entail disrupting the myth that disease outbreaks are exceptional or crisis specific and therefore separate from everyday health inequalities. So a good example of this is how a lot of my um, respondents themselves actually said that the government's response removed care at all and that care is not a core competence of this government that government being under Duterte. Another informant described that the response was not makatao, which in English would translate to that it did not put people's needs at the heart of crisis response. And worse, and this is the most difficult part, many of the health workers were even, especially those working in rural communities, servicing indigenous peoples, were even um, targeted for human rights violations. A number of doctors have been arrested. Most recently in February, 2022, a high profile case was reported nationally after a female doctor, Dr. Nati Castro, who has been serving LUMAD or indigenous communities for years, were arrested on the accusation that she is a communist um, and that the work that she's doing is challenging the government. I don't know why, <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that later. One key informant expressed how despite these threats to their life, still we continue to risk our lives. And these accounts of violence, targeted violence against paid care workers, show how they are caught between a rock and a hard place, abandon their post and face cultural sanctions, or continue to be essential to the pandemic, but face severely limited economic rewards. Worse, they face state violence and reprisal, should they seek to unsettle the security logics by demanding that they be cared for. So I'll end with showing the last slide because it's very relevant um, uh, because, and I'm sure many of you might know that in December, 2020, a woman in her nineties became the first person in the UK and the world to receive a COVID-19 vac uh, vaccine. This vaccine was administered in fact, by a Filipina nurse, Mae Parsons. In an interview, she stated, obviously in the Filipino community and in the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities, we've had, we've had, we've, we have had the highest deaths, but we are still here. We haven't stopped working. Symbolically and materially, Filipino care workers have been shock absorbers of global crises. Their lives, I argue, reveal what is at stake should crises be realized as junctures to shift, if not altogether transform, the boundaries to how social reproduction is valued. Thank you. And I think I went a bit over time, but I hope um, I can um, speak more um, and address questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tenyag, for an amazing talk and very, very sad and difficult to hear, <laughs> too. Uh, uh, Dr. Prugo, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Lua. Uh, so let me just first say how, how, how happy I was to be able to uh, read this paper and be part of this event this afternoon. So uh, thanks, Mariette. Uh, I've followed your work for some time and it's great to finally see you uh, face to face. This is, uh, this is wonderful. I would also uh, actually especially thank you for writing this paper and for doing the research that was uh, associated with this because this paper does a number of, uh, of important things, I think. Um, the first thing that I think it does that's important is that it provides a perspective of caring during the pandemic from the perspective of a country in the South. And I'm obviously speaking here from the perspective of somebody who sits uh, in Europe, 
uh, and who has, you know, followed uh, what's going on with the discussion around care and uh, uh, and the pandemic uh, somewhat. Uh, and and there is actually very little that we know uh, in these international circles or anglophone literature, whatever you want to call it, about uh, what is happening in the South. Uh, and so having this uh, particular uh, the perspective from the Philippines, I, I thought it was utterly fascinating because everybody knows that, that the Philippines is all about caring, right? And yeah. the state kind of, uh, you know, has branded itself as the, the, the exporter. Uh, of carers, to, so to see these other aspects here of the of the hero discourse, which we had here also, but it, it just takes on a very different meaning in the uh, in the in the Philippine uh, context, where carers have been heroes for expert for such for, for some time, right? So so to see that was really fascinating. Also, uh, I, I really liked the understanding uh, the way you're dealing with patriarchal culture, with feminine martyrdom. Uh, through care, being a Catholic myself, that just totally uh, uh, resonated. Um, I, I think the other thing that uh, is really interesting about this paper is that it relates caring in the pandemic to larger phenomena. So you resist this idea of, okay, now we're seeing the carers, we've never seen them. Uh, and it's, it's a new thing because it is the pandemic. Instead, you're saying this is part of a larger uh, political economy and, and I find that also interesting, it is part of a security issue, right? It is uh, embedded structurally in militarism uh, in, uh, and in capitalist tendencies to destroy social reproduction, even though it builds uh, uh, on social reproduction and, and needs that. So you're making the, the pandemic unexceptional which is of course something that that feminists like to do as we like to do with war and so on so so it it even though it's obvious it should be obvious to me as a feminist it wasn't and so you told me that and it was like yes of course right this is how we need to think about that so thanks for that uh, there's, a, there's a third element that I find uh, really innovative of, about this paper, um, which is you, it doesn't just focus on social reproduction, but it asks the question of who cares for carers. So it's actually about social reproduction within social reproduction, if you will. Um, and I think that that actually opens up some really interesting venues for theorizing. And I'm, I'm going to spell this out a little bit and I'm going to stick my neck out uh, and be semi-critical and I wonder what you th think about that. And, and, you know, my starting point as I was thinking through this was actually the question of can this be, uh, can this be applied, is it applicable beyond the Philippines, you know, or is the Philippines such a it is a special case, obviously, right? And I, I tripped in particular the, the warfare over, over welfare um, formulation because immediately I was thinking to myself, well, you know, but the northern governments, I mean, they have done all these massive investments for rebuilding after the pandemic, and there was just a lot of money that came out of that. And you could even say, you know, the US military, I mean, they sent their hospital ships in order to uh, care for. Uh, people that were infected and so on. So, so there was that, and then, um, and then I was, uh, I was actually surprised about that egregious neglect of carers that you describe. Uh, you know the violations of their basic rights, basically, uh, in in these many many ways. And especially then also if you juxtapose it the way in which the international community has now picked up. Um, the theme of developing a care economy. So the ILO is working on this. It was in Davos at the, at the World um, Economic Forum. Uh, so, you know, developing a care economy has become kind of a fashionable uh, thing. And so, so you know, so I'm, I said to myself, well, you know, do I actually really believe this? You know, maybe this is just the Philippines. Um, uh, and, um, you know, in the end, uh, at the end of the paper, I'm saying, well, you know, maybe I'm just not being curious enough here. So, so let me uh, spin out a few things here. Uh, uh, I, I, think, I think you're introducing two key concepts. One is the concept of boundary struggles. Mm -hmm. 
which you follow a phrase around this. So the boundary here is be between economy, society, between production, reproduction, between work, work, family, and that is that is being uh, negotiated here. But in the paper, then you also link boundaries, and and I think that's actually not what Fraser does, but that's something I'd like to discuss actually. Uh, the strong focus on values and valuing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and you, the question do you ask here is who is owed care, right? So who is being valued uh, in in when you ask that question? And and my sense is that the notion of boundaries actually gets somewhat lost in this. Um, so so there's these three modes of caring, which I thought was really really interesting, very interesting formulations, right? So you have the, the economic devaluing and there the boundary become, is still clear, right? It's, it's kind of this, this contestation between the, the private voluntary community workers on the one hand, and then you have, I guess, the public uh, paid healthcare workers on the other. Uh, one is more public, the other is more private. I guess that's the boundary there that was being negotiated. Um, and then you have, you know, in addition to the, this economic devaluing that happens, there's actually a cultural valuing that happens, which is based on, um, you know, these ideas of selflessness, altruism, mutual aid, confident that, that you can take care of yourself, you don't really need anybody else. Um, um, but here I was asking myself, you know, what is the boundary that is being contested here? And I, I would like to suggest to you that in a way the topic becomes a different one because precisely because of that innovative question that you ask mm -hmm. about who cares for the carers. Mm -hmm. And so then the focus becomes really the identity of these carers is who are they? Can they trust the state? And I would go so far, and this is what I'm gonna play with you now, and I'm not sure this is gonna make any sense but I'll, I'll play with it anyway. Uh, are they not actually part of the state? And what, I'm, um, what, what actually got me onto that was your discussion of duty bearers mm -hmm. uh, and sitting in the capital of human rights. It just really bothered me that, uh, you know, that duty bearer, that actually that, first of all, I said to myself, well, you know, an individual is not a duty bearer, actually by human rights, uh, discourse that that's not it the state is a duty bearer and then you have you know maybe companies as duty bearers and things like that but you you wouldn't actually normally say an individual is a duty bearer but then on the other hand maybe they are because if they're part of the state you know they become agents of the state and so they are uh, duty bearers and so um i was asking myself well isn't this focus on the care economy um, that exists now in international discourse, um, is that not an effort ultimately to uh, promote caring as a public purpose so that caring becomes part of the state? Um, and then let me go to the, to the thir third step here, which is the security misvaluing, right? That, that you, had, you had that formulation. Um, uh, which, you know, you formulate as uh, the disease out outbreak is not exceptional. Uh, and, and there you, you talk about the, the continuum. And, uh, and we have these, um, these formulations with, uh, which are really uh, kind of striking in terms of thinking of carers as collateral damage um, and uh, caring also, carers also as, you know, taking risks for the nation, uh, risking death, um, you know, becoming kind of almost like, I, I mean, I was trying to, to relate this also to the way in which we talk about the police or the military, you know, risking lives, deaths, collateral damage, having to serve. I mean, these are all, uh, you know, uh, agents of the state uh, that are called on uh, uh, to do certain things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and in the security misvaluing, you know, is, is the issue here, again, what's the boundary that's negotiated here? And, uh, uh, and is the issue not 
you know, maybe it's it's specifically Philippine that this was a military led, led response, but I think in all countries there there was, uh, I, I see that, right? I, I can totally see what you're saying there, right? That there was kind of this idea of needing to intervene, targeted surgical intervention, you know, securing the population and, uh, um, you know, this, this similarity between the security and the sector and the health sector and, and discursively, I mean, it's something that, uh, uh, that people have of course talked about and so so there's a there's certainly a military element element to this um but i'm wondering whether the nurses are not the lot are the nurses really the logical other of the military you know to the extent that they're both part of the state um is this about nurses finding their space in the state. I find it also kind of interesting in the in the statistics that you provided that the private healthcare providers are actually less trusting of the state than the nurses. I mean, it's, you know, it's marginal. Uh, you're right to point out that mostly they trust the families and communities and so on. But there is this uh, differentiation that you have. In, and, you know, I don't know whether one can make anything out of that to also see how some are more part of the state, I guess, than others. And, and so that boundary uh, uh, contestation that is going on, maybe also a boundary contestation over, you, you talk about the, the state changing its meaning. And I think that's exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. right? And, and like, who, who is, who is uh, entering the state in which way? Who wants to claim to uh, enter in the state? So. Um, so in a way, I guess what I'm landing on is, is to suggest uh, that maybe this crisis-driven re-intervention of the state that you talk about, um, uh, maybe it involves care workers actually as a kind of contradictory figure, right? That, that clearly has no status, right? Or, or not, not sufficient status anywhere, but that is also struggling for status. I mean, you talk about, you know, they should be chaining, joining the task forces and, uh, you know, in some like the difference between uh, uh, the trust uh, of the health workers as opposed to the women's rights service providers, I, I think is also striking. So, so maybe that, um, you know, the, the carers are actually, uh, they're an exploited figure on the one hand, but they're also a heroine. Uh, you have that, um, uh, tension, but then they, they're an, an agent of the state, but they're very marginalized uh, agent uh, of the state. So uh, it strikes me that there's a, a, a kind of a contestation uh, going on that I think it's necessary to uh, acknowledge. And in particular, uh, you know, as this agenda of creating a care economy is moving forward, because I think implicitly uh, what that's going to produce is precisely making caring and social reproduction, bringing that into some kind of more formal arrangement or more valued arrangements or whatever you, you want to call it. But there's, there's something happening here uh, and you're right to focus on struggles and contestations. I think, I think that's absolutely correct. But I, 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 you know, this, the nurse may be more inside the state already than, than maybe you um, you give it uh, uh, credence in, in this paper. So that's, you know, me sticking up my neck, not knowing anything about the Philippines. I'm really curious uh, to, to hear what you think about that. Thank you so much. Um, Lua, do you want me to just... Oh, oh, um, yeah, just uh, if anyone has any questions, please, please feel free to, to ask uh, in the chat. Uh, I mean, we, we are a little bit tight on time so i want to give the floor back to to maria to to respond but also if i can if i can ask a, a few uh, one question just uh, about like your 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 personal motivation to research this theme how how did you get to this topic you know like you're you're doing your research pre-pandemic and then the pandemic hits and then you start seeing these things and how did you your your personal motivation to to get to this topic and how did you start doing that research thank you Really excellent question. I think it's really part of feminist work that we account for why we do things. And, and really, it's been a long-standing interest 
Um, my own family, you know, are very much care, paid care workers too. Um, my mom and my brother works in the hospital and I have cousins who work in, you know, as nurses. So it, it's both as, you know, it's cliche, but it's very personal and political. Um, and I grew up and I talk about this a lot um, in the past um, that, you know, I think as Filipinos, it's so hard to, um, I think almost everyone would have had a migrant worker in the family. And I am part of um, that sort of family, you know, and these sort of complex caring relationships um, as um, in a transnational household or family. And so it was always a, uh, rooted in that strong understanding um, and, and, and finding the language and the concepts to explain what I see in everyday life and through my own intimate um, relationships have been very empowering as well. So I do it in part to make sense of what is happening um, in my you know, immediate caring relationships, um, but it also because of a strong commitment that we actually gain so much knowledge about global politics by starting from the lives of people who have long born crises or conflicts or disasters and starting from their lives who are able to actually trace, um, as um, Lisa pointed out, these these are global, um, definitely global um, phenomena, larger structural um, and discursive processes. Um, so I, I am, it, and it's hard too. Because of that, it's very hard. Um, I think um, I've only started working on this this year, <laughs> um, but I've you know been following and then bookmarking and the emotional toll, toll of it. Um, you know, seeing seeing the you know the cases and the deaths and so on and so it is very much an act of self-care too that you know I kind of waited and, and a lot of things that aren't making sense yet um, but I know I have to do this um, to to actually also in the hope that we make it better because crises like this will happen even more and if we look at climate change reports we're in for <laughs> more of these with greater frequency and intensity and I just feel for like to what extent can our care economy shock absorb when the the time period for them to recover and build resilience is getting shorter and shorter with each one um, and if you look at again these acute cases where um, and I talk about this briefly in the Philippines and perhaps in other parts of you know that are experiencing compounded um, insecurities. Um, since the pandemic, there were two mega disasters that have happened um, and that was just um, uh, in the last year alone. And there's still ongoing conflicts, still ongoing um, uh, killings of human rights defenders and so on. So it's really, um, uh, for me, pressing and it's important. But I really am grateful, if I may just add that, Lisa, because I haven't thought about, of course, it's actually quite paradoxical too, because care economy is so much um, uh, de rigueur now, right, in development spaces. And yet when the pandemic happened, it's as if people, um, you know, were only just aware of, of the care um, economy. And, and that, yes, yeah, sadly, I've been looking at the reports um, in terms of, um, so definitely Philippines not an isolated case where, um, and a few in Europe as well, where healthcare workers were targeted with discrimination, harassment, and violence because of the misinformation around COVID-19 and, and, and resistance around um, uh, if, you know, the pandemic wasn't being contained and so it's because of them, or, you know, and even some governments saying that they're not doing their own jobs or, um, you know, even in the UK um, with all the clapping and so on, um, the, the issue around hazard pay and compensation is, is still very much ongoing um, and, and really how sustainable are our healthcare systems um, when we actually put that, all of those against this strong interest and, and um, uh, you know, emphasis on transforming care economies. It really makes us question, is this also again a, a redux of, you know, gender equality and smart economics and, and all, you know, that sort of work. I, I, I really think maybe there's something there um, uh, to learn from as well. Right. But thank you so much. I have a lot now to think about. Um, and I really appreciate because this is the first time I've talked about this. <laughs> so I'm very happy and, and, and appreciate that um, 
you've actually pushed, pushed and stuck your neck out, as you said, because <laughs> I really need that sort of um, feedback. Yeah. Good. And uh, so once you have, have, have it ready, you should submit it to the IFJP, okay? Yes, <laughs> thank you. I will. It's a very good, strong endorsement. Now I feel even more confident. <laughs> That's good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Maria, would you like to share maybe your email with uh, in the chat so maybe the audience can contact you if they have any further questions? Yes. Um, I want to take thank, thank everyone, especially Dr. Tanyag and Dr. Prugel. Uh, our next Global Voices seminar series is going to be on July 6th. We're going to be talking about the concept of borders. Uh, so it's, it's more of a theoretical presentation, but certainly it's going to be very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who, who is here, who came to watch Dr. Tanyag and this amazing presentation. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for everybody's time. Um, you, you all have a great evening, night, day, whatever it is. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Lua, for a great chair. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.